Hi and welcome to Raise Your Vibes with your host Miriam Khan. I am so pleased today to have a lovely guest on my show. I have uh, Renee Jones. Renee, would you like to introduce yourself and tell our listeners a little bit about you and your background? Mm, thank you for having me. Anytime. Um, I am a coach and counsellor and I spent about 40 years on the diet yo-yo didn't do very well obviously but once I figured out how to get past emotional eating I was able to lose my weight and I have been at the same weight for nine years now well done you and now I help thank you thank you and now I help other women overcome their emotional eating or any other baggage they happen to be dragging with them yeah I mean that to be to be fair can be a big thing so what what started your emotional baggage? What started your emotional eating? If you don't mind me asking. Um, I I think actually, Miriam, we learn it from birth, because when a child cries, we tend to put something in their mouth because yeah. we do soothe ourselves orally. We yeah. put them, you know, the bottle of the breast or pacifier dummy in yeah. their mouths and it gets them quiet and as we get older we tend to distract children with candy yeah or here go do that it'll be fine yeah or we take them out for ice cream when they're upset Correct. you know there are so many ways we use food to soothe ourselves as we go up yeah well i think it was um basically right before my 50th birthday because that's that's when I, I thought okay new year 2012 i'm about to be 50 gotta lose this weight beforehand because you know women can't lose weight after 50 it right it becomes very difficult very difficult yeah very but difficult also a lie yeah there's this stigma also. there's a stigma in society and there's also this um you know society sort of perception it m- annoys me to hell when i see this stigma especially with females we are sort of branded with it all the time I get fed up of reading the newspaper, and I'm sorry, it's going to sound rude, I cannot stand the Kim Kardashian family clan. Sorry, Kim Kardashian (laughs) fans out there. But I do not want to turn a newspaper and go, oh, she's buying a salad, and what? You know, why are we so obsessed? We've definitely, over the last years, we've become so obsessed with what people eat or what they don't eat. And it's it's become a big thing, hasn't it? It really has, yeah. Yeah, because... You know, in the 50s, I suppose, mm. um, there was introduced this idea of low-fat diet. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And then it got created as dogma. Yeah. And it became quite the thing, uh, like in the late 80s, early 90s. I remember my then boyfriend, now husband, saying to me, if you want to lose weight, just cut your fat. I've read this, and I read this stuff, and I was like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I don't know about where you are, but in the 90s, people in the States just exploded. Yeah. They just got bigger and yeah, bigger yeah, yeah. and bigger. I've noticed that yeah. as I've travelled around, if I'm honest. I've travelled to quite yeah. a lot of countries, and the country I'm in at the moment, I will say it's very American-influenced, and the portions mm, are sorry. very American-influenced. But what I'm, I'm so noticing sorry. is the increase in obesity diabetes is huge but the portions yes. are and i'm going to say this phrase as, as i say it from a uk massive or massive, massive yeah. they're huge you yeah. know so much more than anyone needs yeah yeah there is definitely there's this influx going back to what you said about like the the conditioning and like when you're young because uh, i'm a counselor like you and like you i'm sure not just females but males as well have this stigma it can be your culture your perception like i had an old friend may she rest in peace now she, she sadly passed away but she she was a child through you know rationing and uh, through the war and one of the things she did with her food because she was also on this like yo yo diet i guess she would try so hard to lose it and it would just increase and she struggled yeah. to find clothes that would fit her in the UK. You know, she was ordering food, ordering clothes from Dawn French, who's a comedian. You may know her. She yeah. used to work yeah. with Ruby Wax. But, you know, the fact that you couldn't find this sort of like food, you know, food, com- it was a comfort. And her rationale behind it was, Miriam, you need to understand. I-, I never judged her. If anything, I was trying to understand and help her through 
through her situation, she was saying, I'm a child of war, we had rations, and now I'm the complete opposite. I will devour food because I grew up with none. So there's mm, so many yes. complexities, isn't there? It's not just a yes, straightforward, it it's not a straightforward line. No, but any time we eat for emotional reasons, yeah. it's not good for us. No. Right? It's no. just not good for us because we're looking to food to fill a space that it can't fill. That's no. why we can't get enough. No. There is, I mean, I, I don't know about you with your background. I've dealt with people through my, I'm a teacher as well. So I've done a lot of hats, a lot of hats, thank God. But you come across, and personal experience as well, you come across, for example, bulimia. You come across anorexia. The one that I found interesting was pica nervosa, you know, where they're eating paper or rubber or eraser, sharpening, anything. This was people in sports, actually, not just ballerinas. This was people in sports. And it is so interesting that the, the relationship we have with food. And I don't know about you, people that are especially in very poor, 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 poor backgrounds, poor, very deprived backgrounds, and there is this need for instant satisfaction and gratification. Do you agree? Yes. Oh, right. Yeah. Because when you put something in your mouth, A, it's soothing. Mm. B, it, it kicks up your dopamine, Correct. which is the feel-good chemical. Yeah. And it may only last for that long. Yeah. But we'll take it because yeah. it's, it's not the fear, it's not the emotions, it's not whatever is going on around us that we're trying to get away from. Or yeah. as I like to say, we're stuffing down our feelings and following it with a food chaser. Yeah, that's a very interesting concept. Very interesting concept. And I guess well, now... it's the same sort of thing yeah, yeah. as like alcohol. Correct. Correct. You're just trying to get away from what hurts right now, and this will do it. Correct. So it's, it's like a conditioned trauma and a pattern, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, nowadays it is so easy because, you know, I'm sure your generation, my generation, I was brought up with no fast food, you know, right. everything was yeah. home cooked. My mum, bless her, to this day, to this day, bless her, everything is home cooked. And we're talking three, four hours of cooking. We're not talking like that gratification. We're talking basics from scratch, the breads, the flours, whatever dish it was. My mum, bless her, would cook you know, and, and it was that concept of sitting around a table and eating as a family that I don't, that's changed too, hasn't it? Yes, do you think that has a big indeed. impact on what people do as well now? Well, yes, because we can now eat in secret, can't we? Yeah. You can go through the drive through <laughs> or maybe a couple of drive throughs Correct. right? To get the amount you want to eat. Yeah. And we're not paying attention to the food. We're just eating. Yeah. We're not doing it in community, so there's no accountability except on our bodies. Correct. Right? But it, it, it is the, the change in culture around the world is massively contributing to the obesity problem. Yeah. I can remember having a conversation with, I worked in a very, it was a beautiful school that I loved. I, it was somewhere I worked for eight years, in a city high school, very deprived, very, very poor kids very challenging background. It would be almost like kids from the Bronx, like that, or from Harlem. But they were my kids, they were my, my children, you know? And yeah. you, you would have conversations with them and they'd have conversations with you, of course, they'd say, oh, miss, what did you have for your tea last night? So, you know, naturally, naturally you'd have the same question back to them and they'd be like, oh yeah, miss, we went to the chippy. And I'd be, you know, I would not judge, I'd say, okay, what did you have? Because for me, Fish and chips is something quite a lot of English people love. It's a traditional dish. It's a naughty treat, but we have it, you know, and we love the scraps. So fish and chips to me was like a Friday treat or once in a month treat or whatever it was. So I was like, oh, and what did you have the night before? Oh, yeah, fish and chips again. Or we had to the... And I'm like, huh? I said, well, what did you buy? Oh, miss, we got scallops. So I don't know if you know what the scallops are. They're not the fish. It's actually a potato... And it's about that. It's about uh, two millimeters to three millimeters thick. Okay, sliced in like a like a chip shape. Yeah, like a wedge, in batter and fried. Now, they are then sold. Now, prices might be different because we're in twenty twenty one, and I haven't had one in a long while. I've been a good girl. Okay, Renee, I've been a good girl. <laughs> but 
Back then, it was 20 pence. So I'm not sure what that equates to in dollars, but literally peanuts, nothing. So if you're on a small budget, you know, and this kid had five, six siblings, all right? And I was calculating in my head, you know, the mum, the potato slice would be quite big and you'd get it in a butty. Now, I don't want to get into gang, I don't want to get into gang wars or turf wars because in the UK we do, we get into... No, it's a barn, it's a bap, it's a wrap, it's a it's a bread kit. No, whoever's listening, let's not get into the dynamics of that. It's just some simple, sort of bread. Some sort of bread. That's it. <laughs> With the filling. Twenty pence for that content. Mm. Now, if you've mm. got five children and they're hungry and it's cold mm. and mm. this okay it's hot food, it's been cooked, it's done. Doesn't matter about your cooking skills, but you can go for a two minute walk and give your child the money to go and feed you every day. Now, if I was to go to the supermarket myself and purchase, say for example, a kilogram of potatoes, again, prices might be different for those of you listening. It's gonna cost me four times as much to buy the potatoes, let alone pay for the electric or the gas to cook it let alone find the time. Many young parents, especially ones that are young, you know, quite a lot of the parents of these kids were, you know, 24, 25. You know, young parents, really young parents. Some of them necessarily didn't have the the skills, the cooking skills and whatever. Or some of them just couldn't be bothered, whatever their situation, whatever the scenario. But I sat back and I thought, wow, you know, wow. But this is what they're consuming every day. And we would have, I don't know about in the US, we would have a a school nurse, as in from the council, from the estate, that regularly came, weighed, measured, and also then checked their BMI for these kids. And unfortunately, a lot of them, as you can appreciate, would get letters saying, you're obese, you're Mm -hmm. overweight, uh, you're at risk of diabetes, you're at risk of this. You know, there was so many negativity too you know but already the these kids you know they're 11 years old right and from junior because i appreciate in the states it's a different system but it's similar it it, it was tracked imagine that mentality of being told you're fat you're obese Mm. you 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 you're over you're constant i don't even mean as an older adult and this at the time was an old girls school renee it wasn't a mixed later on we became mixed can you imagine yeah that that in your head and mm. you as a teacher are, are, you're watching what's going on around you you know and, and you're trying to build self-esteem for these girls and you're trying to build that confidence same with the mothers bless them you know the mothers they've got kids with different fathers sometimes they don't know do you understand the background you know some of them five yes. six seven di- all different fathers this is their life this is the, this mm. is their background the, the parents don't work they're on benefits. This is the mentality. This is how they would feed their kids. And it would break my heart sometimes. Mm. You know? Yeah, of course. Because how do you change it? Any tips, Renee? <laughs> <laughs> well, in the States, we have our dollar menus at the takeouts, don't you? Right. And it's so much less expensive to eat something that has no nutritional value. Yeah. You know, it, it may be slightly different to what you yeah. not have, but... Yeah, it has to start with the child Mm. and making choices as best they can. Mm. And, you know, I don't know what we can do for the parents unless they have, you know, a lightning bolt of inspiration and influx of cash. Mm. It's hard. But but you you can keep educating and educating and educating, but until, you know, a salad costs less than a chip butty, um, you're not going to make a lot of changes, are you? No. No. And things do cost more when you when you're trying to be healthy and you're trying to be you're trying to change things, you know. What's it like in the states, for example, with with chi- with child dinners at school? Can you give us some examples with oh. with what I've just Am I going to make you cry? Oh dear. No, Let's get the it tissues just, it out. Just frustrates, <laughs> the, frustrates me because um in the last 10 years they decided that tomato ketchup, red sauce could yeah. be considered a vegetable. It's mostly sugar. How can it be a vegetable? Right? And, you know, kids, 
don't want to eat healthy food in no. school. They just don't. No. Correct. So in a, a school dinner could be six kinds of carbs. Yeah. Which is fine and fair enough, but you still need the protein. Of course. <laughs> and you still need something that actually resembles a real vegetable. Because, Correct. you know, <laughs> tomatoes are actually fruit. <laughs> They're not a vegetable. They are a fruit. Was this was this by any chance under Mr. Trump's administration or no? Before that. Before that. Okay, I let him off. I let him off. <laughs> let him off on this one, right? Okay. No, the um, <laughs> when when uh, Barack Obama was our president, right? Uh, Michelle wanted to change things, but unfortunately, the children wouldn't eat the food. Yeah, because it was it was not cool. It was too healthy in some ways and not healthy enough that's when we got the ketchup as a vegetable right <laughs> you can't make this up i am sorry to laugh in it it's just i'm laughing it's by the way it, it's just like unbelievable when you're listening to this because you're sat back going is this really real is this is this stand-up comedy or is this reality i apologize oh, Renee. So <laughs> i can't no, help laughing no, no. As I say, it goes back to the money, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. A school is only given so Correct. much money Correct. to deal with Correct. dinners and sometimes the breakfasts. Yes. You Correct. know, it's, it's like we've got to feed a... I do some work in a behavioral health hospital. Wow. And I had a conversation with a psychiatrist and said, okay, so what if we did this and this and this? And he said, we can't afford to do that. I was like, Seriously? If we pay your fees, yeah. you pay my fees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can't afford to give them the food that will be as nutritious as possible. Because, of course, all of the starches and grains and potato, all those sorts of things, are cheap. They don't cost a lot. No. And they bulk, and people like them. But this, it, it doesn't have enough nutrition to it. No. It, yeah, it may have fiber. Sure. But if the actual nutrition isn't adequate to feed the brain, Correct. which people in a behavioral health hospital need that, yeah, yeah. Then, then what are we to do? Is this, for, is this for adults or is it young children in there or um, what type yes, of... Yes, both. 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 And, you know, they, they need, they're on medication, quite a lot of them, you know, will be on some serious medication to help them rehabilitate, I presume, as well as CBT mm. and psychotherapy and... You know, that's an amazing job. I would love to do stuff like that. I'm looking into that in the future at some point. I'll have to talk to you about that it's another time. Yeah. But going back to the food dynamics, you know, it's interesting. I, years ago, I can remember we had like a change with um, a chef that you might know called Jamie Oliver. And again, it was all about what was in fashion. And this, this you know, person in charge of education, I can't remember who it was at the time, decided suddenly oh we need to get him on the bandwagon and he ruined things i'm sorry to say he really did ruin school dinners he's an amazing chef don't get me wrong anyone that's listening he is he's an amazing chef but from my point of view and i'm entitled to my point of view he messed things up he really did mess things up and it made life very very difficult you know like i said the school i'm talking about we were the only school in it was an area in leeds and uh, it's an area that's called uh, parklands high school and it was in the Seacroft you know and it's the largest council estate in the UK and we had the, the only free breakfast at that time in the whole of that area and our head teacher bless her bless her bless her put money aside to make sure those kids did not pay because a lot of them were booted out of their house at seven o'clock in the morning can you imagine and it was the only place of warmth and the only place of care and love where the doors were open, where they would be looked after. You know, we were the type of school that we were showering those kids. We were washing their clothes, cleaning their clothes. These were extra things we had to go above and beyond. Schools don't do that in the UK. They're not allowed, no. right? So imagine that giving breakfast, you know, you were serving porridge, you know, and that's a good, good source of food or toast, but you had a selection, you know, for example, you would have, the kids would come in and they would want to have, like you said, the sweet and sugary cereals. No, you had to have, for example, toast or a yogurt or the fruit. You, they were given sort of like set menus and alternatives and they tried to enrich that. And a bit like what you said, you know, for, uh, for GCSEs or from Key Stage 3 as well, I don't know about in the States, 
they were taught food technology. So it changed. Mm. It, it was called basically cooking. Back in my day, it was called cooking, you know. But then it became like technical, you know. Mm. So it was called food technology. And I think over time, um, Renee, it became food technology because the, instead of like showing the love of cooking and showing the love of like how to do particular lessons, they went into the scientific element of it. And don't get me wrong, I get that, you know, like for example, teaching them about how to make caramel and stuff like this and the science behind it and da, 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 da. But it got too technical. You know, they were literally like teaching them how to do essays and write in a scientific order, this, 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 this. These kids, Renee, they couldn't even hold a pen pencil. They couldn't even peel an apple. They didn't know. Some of them would, honestly, they didn't know what an apple was. Can you believe wow. that? Can you believe oh, that? That's awful. And these these lessons, you're like, you're watching them, because I'd go in and support. Um, I've, I've got a special educational needs background too, so I would go in with my challenging kids, especially the ones that would use cooking lessons, unfortunately, as a weapon lesson. And there were times you had to restrain kids, if you get what I'm saying, you know, because a knife was, you know, used as a, a weapon, shall we say. Yeah. So you had to like supervise and you had to teach them in, in, you know, how to cut an apple, how to take the core out, how to, how to take the skin off. And these were like, you know, they were doing an apple crumble, for example, you know, now some of them, very basic, very basic stuff, those things now slowly they're dying out, you know, and if you look at the future generation of like young adults, then they're going to struggle. And hence the, the need to go to this fast food implant. Don't get me wrong, Renee, I, I do a naughty thing twice a week. I have done for a long time. Haven't done it in the summer, but I do go and have my hash brown o'clock at McDonald's. I've, I've got to confess. <laughs> <laughs> and interesting that you call it naughty. Correct. Correct. But is it? Is it naughty? You see what we do? You see what we do with yeah. our... With our and the reason I say naughty is because, like, especially now with COVID, like, schools started back. Obviously, I'm still teaching. We're in hybrid learning. And we are scanned with a camera, a thermal camera. And the reason I'm saying naughty now is I come in with this little brown bag. <laughs> it's obviously full of, like, grease by the time I brought it into school. And the thermal camera is obviously checking if I've got COVID or not. And instead of checking for me, it's going ding, 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 ding. And it's like it's saying, she's got a hash brown. <laughs> so you know what I'm saying? Naughty to you. I'm telling, and, and, and you know, people smell it. You're coming down the corridor oh. into school. Oh. And then they, they, they're going, oh, you know, you shouldn't be having that. And again, it's that sense of that society, you know. Of shame. Of shame. And he, feeling naughty, like I said to you, yeah. I, I am someone who watches my diet. I've changed it many times. I um, I can be honest with you and say, yeah, years ago when I was in the flux of teaching, as much as I can cook home, home food, I did unfortunately start eating processed stuff. A lot of yeah. that, I don't know about you, sometimes you're so busy working till daft o'clock, as I call it that uh -huh. you 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 just can't tear yourself away from the work i'd be working till 10 o'clock 12 o'clock marking papers and you you need you know you've got this pressure so i understand uh -huh. some of that is our culture how we are uh -huh. changing in in this work expectation so that you are you're eating you know oh, i've got a frozen pizza i'll just go heat it up oh i've got uh -huh. a frozen meat a frozen meal going back to what you said about the 1950s 60s those takeaway dinners, you know, that were brought in. You'll go into supermarkets yeah. now, back back home, because obviously I'm teaching somewhere else at the moment, but you'll see constant uh, takeaway meals, take frozen meals. Even okay. even the Weight Watcher ones. Have you come across Weight Watchers, Renee? Have you heard of that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> Weight Watchers, Lean Cuisine, all of those, yeah. And they're rubbish. <laughs> they're low calorie, but they're rubbish. <laughs> So what's the solution? What's the solution? There's, there's all these different dynamics. Like I said, we've got social platforms. We've got people with various eating disorders. And it's not just women. It's men too. Men's on the big yes. increase. The amount of boys that I, I, I've come across, which is alarming, 
that will say I'm fat and they're like they're like this they're like a skinny little stick and they're like they have this perception of uh, themselves their narrative I'm going to call it now I don't know about you uh, in their head of I'm uh, fat and you and you personally are looking at them going wow they they are actually quite beautiful looking and you know people would love to be having their physique no that's not in their brain that's not in their image you may have seen a meme somewhere along the way that said i wish i were as thin as when i first thought i was fat wow powerful very yeah, powerful yeah. i mean for me i was heavy once i started school yeah. i was a tiny little stick before i started school but once i got in and had to do just everything in order yeah it blew my my uh, ability to run off all of the calories right yeah. had to eat at a certain time and therefore because i was sort of a like a bird i'd eat a little bit all day long mm. and my mother you know had shares in plastic wrap because she put my plate in the refrigerator <laughs> and i'd come back to it later but once i had to stay in the schedule of things it messed me up and then i thought oh i won't get more food until a certain time mm. which made me want to eat more then Mm. So I I will call even my nephew when he was about 11 maybe right before he hit his growth spurt mm. he said Aunt Renee am I fat I was like no oh. you're a growing boy you're fine don't worry about that you when your growth spurt hits you will struggle to keep weight on you so don't worry about it but yeah they do earlier and earlier and earlier children are saying but I just can't lose the weight. And I'm like, you weigh 95 pounds. Yeah. You're okay. Yeah. But you yeah. know, but there's, it, so many, there's so many trauma around this. This is what's concerning, don't you think? And I know pe people uh, are going to disagree. Like, Miriam, you're saying trauma as in, you know, something very psychological. But it is. It is it because, is, because it is. once once those um you know seeds of doubt are planted in their mind it starts eats, literally as a metaphor eats away at them that negativity yeah. is there and it's conditioned you know isn't it like yeah. the like the pavlov's yeah. dogs it's there yes. it's it's repeated repeated and they can't break it mm. you know it's it's that that's one of the reasons i i called my book what's really eating you it's beautiful because title. it's so much about what's going on inside yeah hunger has very little to do with our obesity yeah it's it's chemistry physical chemistry mental chemistry it's emotional stuff it's spiritual stuff it's all of these factors that go into who we are and if we can ever get them in the right proportion to each other then we wouldn't have a problem anymore. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Correct. But instead, we instead of facing our stuff, we just stuff our faces. Yeah, and unfortunately, we keep forcing it more and more. And yes. I don't know about you, but since now there is, you know, going back to these celebrities that I'm mentioning to you, you know, and it's not specific, but also we're in a culture now. I don't know about yourself where you've got the other spectrum so you've also got the quick fix of okay let's do a gastro belt you know let's do uh, sorry to pick on that subject but it's true there's this other no. quick fix of let's yeah. have for example do that or let's go and do liposuction or do some plastic surgery now this is the other side because that is also in a in a way a quick fix it's not it's not removing the psychological emotional spiritual journey have you got no, some experience fact, on that well half my clients when i first started doing weight loss were people who were five years out from their bariatric surgery and they'd regained all the weight Oof. i have a a good friend who is a bariatric surgeon we talk about this yeah. it's like it it will work if you follow the plan but if you don't deal with that emotional eating you cannot starve yourself long enough Correct. to keep the weight off because eventually you get to this oh i'm starving now yeah, fact, yeah i mean that's basically where i was in 2014. i i had lost my weight 
I was struggling to maintain it. I was tired, hungry, and cranky all the time because I was still doing low fat, low calorie. And I thought there's got to be more to life than this. So I took a metabolic test and the metabolic test said, you need more fat and protein in your life. And I thought, fat, we've been avoiding it for 50 years now. You've been like, no, I don't know if not I can... the fat. No, can't, can't do fat. <laughs> I thought, okay, I'm okay. I'm at my goal weight. I'll give them a week hmm. and see what happens. Miriam, I lost two pounds that week. Wow. Eating cheese sauce and bacon and butter. The things and you love. And protein loved. and best Things you love. things I love. <laughs> and it was, it was still sort of like, I don't know, I think it was 1,300, because I'm a little woman. I'm only five foot three, right? Okay. I'm not very tall. And with even 1,350 calories, 1,400 calories, I was satisfied all day long. And I think, oh, crumbs, i got to eat again. And that, that had never happened to me. That's an interesting word as well, isn't it? Satisfied. Satisfaction. Yeah, it's because if word. you're not satisfied, I mean, this is why this is why we eat more biscuits. Correct. Because we're not we're not getting what we need. And I heard someone talking about this has become a thing of late in the states is the whole protein question. Mm. And you know, we eat more carbohydrates, more starches in order to get the protein that our body is lacking. That's why we can't, part of why we can't stop, yeah. right? But, but that has so little protein in it that it takes a lot more to satisfy the body. Correct. So Correct. If, you, if you find what actually works for your body and everybody's different. I have a cousin who could not survive on what I eat. She just, it would make her ill in so many ways. Just like sure. I had a vegan friend who said, you need to go vegan. Okay, I tried that. I was sick. Yeah. It just was didn't give it's not me right for you. Yeah, yeah. It's body. not right for what yeah. you need. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So if you find what works for your body, not only will you shed weight almost effortlessly, yeah. not quite. You do still have to make choices. Correct. But if if you get the nutrition that works with your body chemistry, then you'll be more satisfied. You won't have so many cravings once you get adapted to it yeah and your weight won't be so much of a problem no many the satisfaction will do it many people struggle with that satisfaction though don't they you know you know it, it, stereotypically you go you go out for a meal with your friends you know and you you know for example you and i could go out we could go and go into a restaurant we could order our meal we could order our starter we could order our main then it comes to dessert there's always dessert right and as it's much always as your, a dessert compartment. Exactly. Your stomach is saying, I call it food baby, by the way. Okay, so if I have eaten and I've had a good meal, I jokingly say this food baby number one, food baby number two, food baby, and so on, right? But my stomach is really happy at this point. That's, a, that's what I mean about that satisfaction. You've had a good meal. You can tell because you're full. Some mm -hmm. people are never full. As we've discussed, they will constantly keep, like you said, like that pacifier, keep, keep eating, eating, eating. They don't understand that, that you know, it's up to, literally up to their neck, the food. They'll keep eating. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, when we go to the dessert, you're looking at it, you're tempted. You think about it. But there is this temptation there all the time, isn't there? And, and you're thinking, yeah. mm, I shouldn't really, I shouldn't, you know. There's this yeah. guilt as well. Like you said about when I was mentioning the breakfast, but, you know, many people nowadays, they're trying, for example, some are, are getting into their sports, some are not. Some will eat something like that and then maybe do 100 laps up the stairs, you know. There's this guilty connection. I'm not saying go to church and do Hail Marys, you know, <laughs> for example. <laughs> but you might, you know, I know a friend of mine that wouldn't get the lift up 12, 12, 12 floors, would instead climb the steps. Now, don't get me wrong, that takes a lot of dedication because for me, I would be having a seizure. I'd be like, <gasps> can't breathe, you know? I'm sure that's a lot of stairs. It is a lot of stairs, yeah. But we, we yeah. have this, like, mentality of guilt and, mm. you know, also enjoyment. There's this, like you said, this psychological aspect to it that goes so deep. 
And I think when you, like you probably know yourself, when you're talking to these clients, like, what's your trigger? What is it? What little part of you is it that's unfortunately allowed you after this surgery to go back on the wagon, so to speak? What What is it? And they sometimes don't know the answer, do they? Well, they say they don't. And I said, okay, so you don't know. But if you did, what would you think? Hmm. And they they always do know. Somewhere within them, they know. It's just helping them tease it out. Yeah. Out and find the right words for it yeah. and you know I, I i don't know that anybody can actually do that on their own it's hard sometimes they need help to figure it out it's hard to and, be and, respective isn't it it's hard to you know i i've called this the like michael jackson phrase it's looking at that man or woman in the mirror and saying you know i'm okay i love me that's such a hard journey Renee. i've covered it in a podcast but that's what they struggle with they struggle so my theory is there is a worldwide epidemic yeah. of self-esteem correct yeah. because we all go through that i'm sure even starting your podcast you're like oh can i do this will yes. anybody want to listen oh, yeah. why would they want to listen to me i right? didn't do that i was like i'm gonna do this and if they listen they listen if they don't they don't but some people would correct some people i mean yeah. i know when i started uh, coaching it was like why would anyone hire me <laughs> you should, you know, it's just fear. me yeah it's fear but you know, thankfully I got past all of that yeah, right yeah, but yeah. we we think that we need something and it's usually something outside ourselves yeah. and because we can't build that enough on our own within ourselves to say no I'm alright yeah I can do that it's okay I remember um, when I was doing my TEDx talk, I was scared to death because it was a year before my husband suggested that I become a public speaker. I was like, Lev, I'm <laughs> never going to be a public speaker. you got to get over that. Well, a year later, I was standing on the TEDx stage. Well done, you. It was scary, I have to say. But it went well. Yeah. And I came off the stage thinking, wow, that was the scariest thing I've ever faced. Was that because the cameras? Were, was that because the cameras were on you, or people were listening, or what was it that that was making you feel that? Well, a I hadn't done it before. Right. I had done talks with with some cards and, and just a couple. Sure, you know, but that one has to be completely memorized. Right, and it's in front of a group of a theater full of people. Sure, you know the cameras didn't bother me. It was all the people that were either sure. engaging or not. Sure. Right? And they're not all interested in my topic. <laughs> <laughs> but it was it was just being able to stand up, not trip over words, yeah. deliver value to this group of people who didn't necessarily care about my topic. Yeah. And it it was just frightening to me. So your own worst I, critic I, I have, is you at this point in your in your subconscious. Yeah. You yeah, see, we'll absolutely. put, I mean, understandably, for those of you that are tuning in and listening to this podcast with Renee, we'll put all these links in, in the bio. We'll put the link in for her books, her, her YouTube channel, and obviously the TED Talks. We'll put all of that information in the bio. And I think you have a help um, side as well, like a, something you can click for further information as well if they want to connect oh, with absolutely. you as well. So all of that we will put in. Um, I can relate to that, Renee, because... I also have done speaking. I believe it or not, you might be shocked to discover this. I used to be so shy. I know you're shocked to hear me that. Me too. <laughs> me I got too. I got over that. Hashtag me too movement. Um, <laughs> <laughs> when I was 18, I got the job of working in a bank and it changed my life forever. And um, I was a, a very quiet Muslim girl. I had the whole hijab. I had the whole. I, I'm 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 liberal Muslim now. I follow what I believe is my faith, but back then, very very strict, very strict. You didn't say boo to a goose. You followed what the men said in your family, and you know so on. And that job changed me in massive ways because I had to speak to clientele. I had targets in the bank. I've done a YouTube video on this, but basically, I had to be thrown in the deep end. Now years later and i mean years later obviously you're a teacher you're in the classroom i have my own little audience but don't get me wrong speaking to a wider audience and things like that is different 
Years Not later, closed. yeah, the school that I was telling you about, it ended up being closed by the government. It was being forced to be closed because they were trying to push it into a mixed school and turning it into an academy, which basically means that the government doesn't run it anymore. People come and buy it, it becomes privatized and all of this stuff. And they sacked the head teacher. And on the day they sacked, which they can't do by the way, but they did. And the day that they did that, I had become the union rep. I was positioned and I'm sat there going, I can't do this, why has she chosen me? And for some reason, everybody selected me. Well, off I went to my first like union meeting and I, and I raised these points and the gentleman at the time, I didn't know who he was, he came up to me and he said, you do realize you speak so well. And it was one of those moments where somebody sees something in you and you don't see it, you know? And he was like, we need people like you. Now he didn't look at the color of my skin. He didn't look at my gender. He didn't look at any of those things. He just looked at me and he said, you speak eloquently. Can you, can you spare one hour, one month to come to some meetings? I would love to have somebody young like you on our panel, passionate. And I'm looking at him like, what? You know, uh, come along and come to these union meetings. Well, to cut long story short, I ended up working for them. I ended up getting a secondment and I'm now uh, a trained legal caseworker. And it was through Harvard wow. University. And I ended up speaking, you know what I'm saying? I ended up speaking mm -hmm. from small groups and becoming the president, the vice president to being an assistant secretary. People had to vote for me, 4,000 people voted. I won, I got the job. I was so humbled by that. And I ended up uh, on a podium speaking to 7,000, 8,000 people at conferences from that small little thing. And when you're, at, when you're at conferences for the union, it's hard because you have three minutes. You've got a podium light and the topic could be something about education. But there's 20, 30 people who's already said what you, you were going to say. You have to think like that. And you can't repeat and you can't look like an idiot in front of the other people that's already said what you're gonna say. So you've got to really think hard. Those people sat there writing essays and essays and essays and scrap, and I'm like, whoa. And you know, I don't know whether it was God, spirit, whatever you wanna call it, I would just get up and speak from my heart. Didn't need the notes, thankfully. But I would just, I would just listen to what they're saying and all the coaching and the training they gave me that really boosted my steam and I would just, be, be free and they would say to me don't you feel the pressure of like the camera don't be wrong the first couple of times my leg was like almost like i had parkinson's <laughs> you know behind the podium where because there's like these three little lights there's like a green light an orange light and an amber saying your time's nearly up and three minutes isn't long to try and get your point across on top of no. massive film crews big massive screen that's behind you on this side the heat off the flashlights forget all that and there's all these people saying about your makeup don't even have time to do all that jazz you're more you're more you're more, you're more focused on that buzz is gonna go i need to get my point across i need to get my point and there's a sense of urgency and for me if i hadn't have gone through all those things i don't think i'd be doing my podcasting now that's the ironic oh. thing so I can really relate to you because in that position, you, you don't see the beauty of who you are. Yes, and, and I'm sure indeed. these people with these issues have got the same thing. There's no difference. Mm. Mm. They don't begin to recognize the value they bring to the world. Yeah. And I feel that part of my job, not only is help them lose the weight, but yeah. to help them heal their heart so they can then take that out to the world and be more productive and helpful to the world. So how can, how can we, you know, going forward, how can we both help people? You know, obviously you do the counseling, I do the counseling, we try to educate, but is there more? Is there more that we could do as a community, as a global community that to help people fight this or overcome this or be aware? What, what more can we do? Well, I think the body positivity movement has been trying mm. to say, it's okay, you don't have to be a stick insect, mm. right? But on the other side of that, 
It's like, oh, now I've got free reign to eat anything and everything, and it's okay. Well, yeah, it's okay physically in in acceptance, but it's not okay for your body. No. Your health is going to suffer. Correct. I read this week in the paper, um, they actually have have identified that 35% of Americans are now obese, morbidly obese. Oof. Now, that's in addition to the 30-35% that are already overweight. Wow. And that's going to create so many health issues. Yeah, Type yeah. 2 diabetes is rampant. Yeah, yeah. Right? And... It's because we eat too much sugar. Yeah. Right? I mean, if you think about the 19th century, they didn't consume a lot of sugar. No. And once they took all the fat out of products, what they did was they added, added more sugar. Think about that yogurt that you gave the children. Yeah. How many grams of sugar is in every one? Correct. Where yogurt can be lovely yeah. on its own, or maybe you use some fruit to sweeten it, but all the excess Correct. sugar they put in. And that's that's partly because our they did research to find out what will make something called the bliss point of food. Okay. Which is the perfect um, combination of salt, sugar, and fat. That means you can't eat just one. <laughs> why am I not surprised? Why. why am I not surprised? Why am I not surprised? It'll sell, it'll sell more, won't it? I mean, in the 19th century, you're going back to those particular times, we didn't have the influx of import and export. Obviously, we were we were limited to our travel and our, you know, our transport at the time was limited. You know, we had the voyages and various other things. And obviously, we didn't have the technology that we've got now where, okay, we've got expiry dates and end of dates or end of shelf dates, you know, and that sort of thing. Now you've also got in various countries you've got an import export is business like you said you know it is business like you said you've got these companies that claim it's no sugar low fat whatever but secretly it's not you know um in the UK they introduced a, a sugar tax did you know this ah, yeah, several, I heard about that. Several, <laughs> I'm laughing I shouldn't laugh but several years ago, this was introduced. And again, it's almost like, how many more taxes are you going to take off us? You know? Mm. So, so now you're punishing us also for like having a drink that's with sugar. So you're going to charge us extra. Again, it's that mentality of, you know, we're going we're gonna to punish you. Whitchung! There's like a whip sort of scenario. Well, you know, when I, I, I went to live in Wales when I was 23, I took a job there. Okay. And I was there for two years I was back in the States and then back there for another couple of yeah. years and I was shocked when I first got there your sweet tooth is not as ravenous as ours is no right we like things a lot sweeter correct so to think about now you guys having the same sort of sugar tax idea <laughs> because you're taking in too much sugar it's like what's happened to you <laughs> in it's 30 some odd short years what has happened to you yeah. Like I said to you, it's going back to what I said, you know, um, targeting specific people. They're, they're keeping these records. And again, that could be a, com a complete different uh, matrix style, X-file style conversation, which we'll do another time, I'm sure. But, you know, these people that are keeping these records and telling us we're fat, mm -hmm. obese, whatever, this is where it's come from. Because, it, you know, saying, um, you know, you're not drinking water, you're not drinking... Um, instead of drinking water, you know, you're drinking sugary drinks and you're drinking this and you're drinking that. Obviously, all the time you, you're having all these experts, you know, one minute you're reading a newspaper saying you must drink eight glasses of water a day. You must cut out wine because of this. You must cut out red meat because of it. There's constantly this contradiction, too. So I think as human beings, we're constantly confused all the time. You know, quite a lot of sports people, I, um, I know a lot of people in sports that have gone the whole protein shakes and, you know, gone to, whether it's steroids as well. That's that's another conversation I'm sure, Renee, we can have another time. But they also look at their diets. The latest fad is the keto one. Have you come across that? The keto? keto oh, yeah. Keto, I'm probably saying with, yeah. my, with my thick Yorkshire accent. <laughs> Yes, you are. We call it keto. Keto, keto. <laughs> it's the same thing. <laughs> well, okay, so here's, here's the thing about keto, though. 
the the thing that fascinates me is that that's how people used to eat all the time. We used to have meat and veg, meat and veg, yeah. meat and veg, and it was you know potatoes were more for people who didn't have much money. Yeah. Your, your people who were sort of middle and upper class didn't do that many potatoes because they grew in the ground. Why would yeah. you eat that, right? Yeah. So if, in fact, my grandmother back in the 70s told me, she said, Renee, if you just watch your sugars and your starches, you'll be fine. Well, that's what keto is. Yeah. It's taking out as much starch. You can yeah, have yeah. a little, but not excessive. Yeah. And take out the sugar because that's a disaster waiting yeah. to happen. And, you know, it's got a bad rap. And unfortunately, I know way too much about how our nutritional guidelines have come up, right? Mm. And it's not helpful. I mean, no. clearly, those nutritional guidelines has helped us so much, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you look at people, and we've just got more and more obese. Correct. But if we went back to a basic human diet, you can have all the flavors. Just watch your sugars and your starches. Yeah. So, you know, keto low carb whatever do what works for your body correct it's i mean the this low fat thing the mediterranean diet was changed after world war ii because yes. the whole of europe was decimated yeah, right? yeah. and like i said yeah. to you so, hard to get hard to get things into the country like right now with the uk since we've come out of Brexit, let's not go into Brexit, Renee. I'm going to sit here crying. Leave it, leave it. But, however, people are now struggling to get, for example, fruit and veg from the Mediterranean. Things that we mm -hmm. relied on heavily. Because when would we get tomatoes or red peppers or, you know, now zucchinis, as you call it, courgettes, you know, aubergines. You had this influx of this food. Now everything is quadruple the price. Yeah. You know, yeah. because because of the changes. So we're going back yeah. to, like I said to you about the 19th century, it's it's costing more. And I don't know about yourself, um, I was seeing a big influx of organic as well. Um, and, and it's funny, I want to link this back to what you've just said prior, in your prior conversation. Class and organic, mm -hmm. you know. In the States, I'm sure you have a similar system. In the UK, we definitely clearly have... We have the bourgeoisie. We don't say that, but we do. You know, you have the aristocrats. And then you have the proletariats. And unfortunately, there is another title, which you may not know. It's called Chavs. So some people... Yes, unfortunately. For anyone listening, I am not being derogatory. I'm just using a UK term. So Chavs can also mean council house and violent. To quote, uh, to quote a famous nice. singer called Plan B from one of his songs. Cool dude, look him up. He's an amazing artist. He's an actor now. But there is this mentality that, you know, if you're not educated, you know, for, you know you, you're going to have that misconception. Now, the aristocracy, for example, and I appreciate I'm stereotyping here, but breakfast might be caviar, darling, and smoked salmon and asparagus, you know. And I am putting that bourgeois accent on you know but it sounds like a waitrose and marks and spencer accent and renee is sat here in marvel at my accent and he's laughing hysterically but you see what i'm saying you know yes yes i mean there is that um education and opportunities do tend to change things for us don't correct they? correct Correct. But if you're if you are trapped in the um, lower income bracket, yeah, it makes it really hard to break out. It does. Yeah. I I can remember years and years ago reuniting with one of my friends that was a school friend. We had a high school reunion. You've just reminded me of this story, and I went to go and visit them. I hadn't seen them for like twenty odd years or whatever it was. And he had a 16-year-old boy at the time, you know, double of his dad, absolute double of his dad. And it was the dad and I who'd gone to school together and we obviously hadn't seen each other. It was really beautiful to catch up with them. And he said to me, he pulled me aside and he said, Maroom, I don't know how to say this and, and I'm really struggling and I don't know who to ask. And there's a reason I asked you to come and see me. It's not just because of, because of I want to see you. So I'm obviously like really like, curious as to what is what is it what's confession is he going to tell me you know and he said 
I think my son's got special needs. I said, right. He said, and, and I know you've got this background, but can you help me? Because I think he's got ADHD and I don't, I think I should go and get him tested and I think I should be able to claim money for him because you can get, you know, on on the spectrum, on different spectrums, you depending on the child and depending on what happens in schools in the UK, they are obviously diagnosed, they're put on a special needs register and some students receive funding. Now, obviously he was at 16, so he's at that point where he's leaving school. At that time, the law didn't support him. Now it does because the special needs changed. Now it covers zero to 25, which is brilliant. So it covers students at university, for example, you know, they're not left uh, without support, you know, which is a brilliant thing. And I'm sat there like listening to him and I'm thinking, what? You know, it's one, it's very late, but I, I appreciate this must have taken a lot of guts for him to even say this to me. I said, OK. I said, will you just observe him? Will you just tell me? Da, 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 da. So I said, all right. So we were having breakfast. He comes in. I, I get cornflakes and I get, you know, cereal. And I'm very grateful for what I'm given, you know. And if he's listening to this, I am very grateful to this. But the son, his breakfast that the mum serves is a can of Tizer. A can of Tizer. A Tizer is like um, a very, very fizzy drink. And yeah, okay. It's okay. like not Seven Up, and it's not like Tango if you know Tango. But imagine it, but lots and lots of sugar, and I believe it's manufactured in Scotland or somewhere like that. I still think they do it, but very, very, very sweet drink, mm. can can of pop, and then on top of that, he's having candy. That was his breakfast. Yeah, that and, would uh, make you ADHD, wouldn't it? Yeah, and then he's tell, and I was watching him. I w- I'd stayed for a while, and I observed. I was quiet about it. I felt like nanny nine one one at this point. You know, like watching, watching, watching what they're doing and watching what they're saying, and then ready to pull him aside and go, "Your son's not ADHD from what I've seen." However. Have you thought about his diet? Have you thought about what he's actually putting into his body in the morning, at break time, whatever, you know, whatever time it was? Because throughout that whole day, all I saw was binge eating, sugar, chocolate, 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 chocolate. Again, this was a family that is not wealthy, but there are some stores where, like you said, um, the dollar, I think you call it the Dollar Tree in the States. Yeah. Yeah, am yeah. I right? Pound shop for like you, a right? pa- Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Pounderland, love. Pounderland. <laughs> oh, th- now, I mean, I, I'm not into those stores anymore, but I know there's, like, bargain stores, home basement. There's so many that will do these um, banging deals, as they call it, banging. And it's all for a quid, a squid, as we say, squid, quid, you know? And that is literally lot, not a lot of money, but you have, like, all these packed deals, so, of course, you're going to go for the sugary stuff. Again, like I said, but I was sat back and I had to break it to him in a gentle way that you need to, you know, if you as an adult are eating cereal and cornflake and whatever, why is he not joining you and trying? And he's not got ADHD from what I can see, but it's his diet. And it was such a hard conversation I had to have, Renee. Seriously, yeah. it, it, I had to do it so gently and I had to tactfully just say, like, he needs to change his diet. But it's so interesting that, as a Senko, the number of people you meet that automatically label themselves, you know, yeah. I've got behavioural problems, I've got emotional problems, I've got this, and it's not. It's, it's what they're eating. It's what they're consuming. Yeah. Or what they're yeah. not eating. Yeah, absolutely. Well, even even for myself, yeah. right? When, when I went to live in Wales, I was not accustomed to the temperature because I live in Texas, right? Oh, it's, yeah, from hot, hot, hot to cold, cold, cold. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I bonded with cups of tea because I, I like tea. Yeah. And I bo- because it kept my hands warm. It was like, okay, now I can get my hands warm. <laughs> and the job that I had was I did a lot of visiting. And you know, you can't go to a British household you without can't just cuppa. pop in and say hi nope. without a cup, right? <laughs> and I was one of those old Americans who didn't drink coffee, so I drank tea. And I could easily down 
10, 15 cups of tea a day. And I got worried about myself. I thought, I'm getting awfully anxious. I'm getting awfully anxious. And I said to my, my supervisor, I said, you know, I, I find myself being very anxious. And he said, you might want to cut back on the tea. <laughs> <laughs> but I love my tea. He said, yes, it's got caffeine in it. You realize that. That's making you anxious. Anything, good things, yeah, yeah. can affect you in a negative way if you get too much of it. Yeah, yeah. And particularly sugar. My question, Actually, Renee, is will you serve tea with biscuits? Well, or... I gave up sugar six years ago, so... But no, I when you were in Wales, biscuits. when you were in Wales oh, at the time... Biscuits, see, Welsh cake, tea cake... There you go. You, that's know, you see, that's the other thing we did. <laughs> we do it for hospitality, no Renee. It. We do it for hospitality. Absolutely. <laughs> and it would be rude of an American to say, no, thank you. Exactly. Right? So you do what, what works in the culture... So you're not rude. You don't want to offend people. No, no, no. But I, I had to give up some of my tea later or earlier when I was on my own. It's like, that okay, I've had enough tea today. That must have been really but, hard. Because your body also, you, you know, I have another friend, ironically called Renee, who's from Arizona, who lives in England. And like you, freezing cold, she'll be attached to a radiator with a thick double coat on. And she'll be like, I'm frozen. You know, and there's not enough Irish. There's not enough Irish coffees to keep mm -hmm. you warm. Let's put it that way. No. So how That's did true. you how did you get over that tea intake? What did you do? How did well, you detox? Um, I, I pretty much once I left and I came back to the states, um, I had we we couldn't at the time get proper British tea without it being ridiculously expensive, expensive, right? And I was going to graduate school. So I packed about 2,000 tea bags in my suitcase. <laughs> you didn't! Home. Renee! I, did, I, did, I, did. I loved it. I loved it. And every time I visited, and I've, apart from 2020, yeah, I've been in Wales every even numbered year since 1986. To, to stack up on your tea. <laughs> to visit friends, right? So, and, you know, then Tetley came to the USA, you can get it there, and yeah. now you can get it in Walmart, Asda, that sort yeah. of thing. So it's it's fine now. But I knew it, to manage for two years, I had to cut back my rations. Ooh. So I cut myself back to four cups of tea per day, yeah. or four tea bags per day. Yeah. And it was, I was falling asleep because already, you know, the whole time shift thing of six yeah. hours... And I, I do really well going forward in time. Going back in time is the thing I have trouble with because I'm, I'm an early riser. Sure. So staying awake until a decent time was hard for me, but I'd be awake at five. It's like, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it was it was hard, and now I've gone back to a very bad habit of, of tea. tea. <laughs> she says, listeners, whilst, whilst she's saying that, she sat there nonchalantly sipping the tea. I will say that she's not there with chocolate digestives or biscuits or anything like that. So, Renee, she's, no, she's just doing, cup, she, it's just, just tea. It's just tea. And she's only had the one cup. I can vouch for that. She's only had the one cup. So, you know, she's not being, you know, she's not have hypocrites. She's not being hypocritical. What would you, what advice would you say to anyone, you know, listening in? Obviously, we're going to put in the links for your book and the links for your TED, TED Talks. But moving, you know, moving forward to try and help people with the issues that they've got, there's, there's not going to be one clear answer, is there? There's going to be a plethora of things. So we've said about working on ourselves. We've said about working with the person in the mirror. What else can we do to help ourselves be, be better with our issues with weight and food? Well, I, I say it's not hard to overcome emotional eating. You just have to get the hang of it. And hang is an acronym. Yeah. And... The first question you ask yourself is, am I hungry? And if you're hungry, you may need something to eat. But if you're not, go to the A. What is your attraction to food? What's drawing you to it? What's going on for you? And then the N is need. What is it that you actually need? Do you need to take a little walk? Do you need to have a cup of tea? Do you need to play with the dog? Do you need a hug? Do you need to go get a manicure? You know, whatever. Mm -hmm. What is it that you actually need? And then the G is go. Go get that because that will soothe you more than food ever could. That's a beautiful acronym. Is that in your book, Renee? No, I came up with that afterwards, I think. Wow. Could be. I can't remember. It's been a while since I wrote that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good one, though. It's a real good one. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. And, you know, it's helpful because yeah. it's easy to remember, right? Yes. 
Yes, and it's something we can all relate to. Any other tips or advice that you'd say to listeners tuning in as well, other than that one? Um, I think it's important to know what helps you deal with expectations. Hmm. There's a what I what I learned along the way was I'm what's called an obliger. If you've asked me to do some it, something, I will get it done. Yeah. No matter what. But if I'm asking myself to do something to hold my goals, eh. So I have to make all of my accountability external. That's why a coach works so well for me. Yeah. I I walk my dog every morning. And the way I set myself up with that was she needs a walk. She's a much better puppy when she's had a good walk. Yeah. So she's my external accountability, you see. Yeah. When I was going to a gym, I knew Daniel was going to be waiting for me when I got there. Sure. And he opened up just for me to come at 7 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. So I better be there. So finding how you deal with those kinds of accountability is really helpful. It's now, so, I do have yeah. a um, an exercise online if it's helpful. Sure. And it is how you can set a goal and keep yourself on track for that goal. And that's at packyourownbag.com slash friends. And we'll put this in the bio for, for our listeners. Lovely. And what can Good. what can they do from that link then? What what would they find there? Can you just give some brief information for that? Yeah, 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 yeah. It is an exercise called the compass. And essentially, you think about what is it you want? Miriam, what do you want? Right now, I would like to make an income from my podcast show, for example, so that it's a future okay. career. So that is your goal. That yeah. is your compass. Yeah. So from that, every decision you make either takes you toward that or away from that. Correct. So if it's away from that, you go, well, maybe I ought to think about that again. If it's toward that, sure, go for it. Yeah. Because that is your compass. Yeah. And I actually give my clients a wristband. And it says, check your compass. Wow, awesome. To remind them, sometimes you've just got to check, okay, is this taking me toward my goal or away from my goal? Wow. So you had those specially made. Yes. That's yes. beautiful. In, in various colors. Beautiful. <laughs> beautiful. <laughs> well, um, at the time, wristbands were a thing, right? <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no. I think it's really nice because it's a constant reminder, isn't it? Right. Yes, it's and amazing. I say you don't have to wear it. Just put it somewhere you can see it. Yeah, yeah. It's fine. Yeah. Well, nowadays it's, it's different. It's really I mean, the, what you've just shown me looks like a just like an item of jewelry, like that most people wear. They have quite a lot of them, don't they, for um, going on concert. It looks like something I would wear from a concert. So it's discreet. Yes. I like that. I really do like yeah. that. I will put all this information that Renee is talking about in the bio. And obviously, you can click on the links and hopefully, you know, find a way. And obviously, Renee, if they want to book a coaching session, they can do that too. Would you be able to give some information about that? So if they want to book you as a coach, um, how, do they go about, how do they go about that? Obviously, I'll put the link in the bio. But do you want mm. to give a bit of brief information about what you're able to offer them? Yeah, um, typically, I, I try to figure out what it is they need. Mm -hmm. Do you need months of coaching? Do you need three months of coaching to, to help you get on track and stay there? Mm -hmm. I have a package of that. I also have like courses, um, online courses that you can take. One is like, what are the triggers of emotional eating and how do you overcome them? And then one is more uh, basically my text for my coaching practice. Yeah. So if they want to, to talk about any of that, I offer a free um, consult brilliant seriously free no no you know if you if if it works for you great if it doesn't that's fine okay we have to find what works for us but just go through the website packyourownbag.com cool brilliant renee it has been an absolute pleasure having you on the show i it doesn't even feel like a podcast show it felt like a stand-up comedy but very entertaining but also very enlightening and uh, I just want to say thank you very much because this has been, it's a serious topic, guys, but also one that you have to be human about it, don't you? You mm. definitely have to be human. Yeah. And, and Renee, I am sure we will definitely have you back on my show because I can see this brilliant connection between the two of us. We have a lot in common. And I just want to say thank you for being on our show. Thank, thank you, very you for much. having me. You're welcome. You're welcome.